Hello, my name is Dylan. And I'm Katie. We are some of the young adults who attend Providence United Methodist Church. Our congregation is multi-generational and there are ministries for people of all ages. We invite you to worship with us. We have a 9 a.m. service and a 1030 service. Our 9 a.m. service is held indoors and masks are required. Our 1030 service is held in our parking lot and live streamed on Facebook. We are located at 6450 Bringle Ferry Road, and we look forward to worshiping with you soon. Thank you.
church family. I'm honored to be able to still be a part of your worship today. I want to have you think about Paul back in his time before his conversion. Sometimes we're like him. We think we've got everything straight. We've got all the answers and we're strong in our convictions. But just like Paul, sometimes we need to get out of our own way because he missed the most important thing and that was Jesus Christ. And when we take Him out of our worship and out of our focus, no matter how strong our convictions, we're heading in the wrong direction. If you'll bear with me, I'd like to go to God in prayer on your behalf and mine. If you'll pray with me. Heavenly Father, we know we don't have it all right, but we have a God who knows all things. The sovereign God of the universe. And we know that you are there at our disposal, that you hear our prayers, that you never close the door or tune out your children. You are always receptive to our input, to our worship. And you always, in your timing, answer our questions. So, dear Lord, be with us, not only today, but throughout this week. Help us to look to you for the answers, to be still and hear words from our Lord that we might make the right choices, that we might go in the right direction, that regardless of our convictions, we'll be going down the path you would have us to go. Dear Lord, no matter what the troubles are this week, we know you are there with us to help us through those times of sadness, to help us through those times of sickness, and to lift us up and to put us back on the path that you would have us to go. And now, dear Lord, touch our hearts, touch our minds, open them up, that we might be receptive to the worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. At midnight, with our headlamp song, and in the hen house, trying to find the chicken that laid the eggs. Sometimes doing crazy things makes for a good night. I'm not sure that we got the one, but we got one here. So, and we're not letting her out. She's too big. Can you see her? I don't want her to get around. She's going to be a mess. But I've got a little bread. I've got a little bit of bread. And she hasn't had breakfast. Just drop it down. Uh, and Tiff, out here, you've got new chicken, baby chicks. And Silas, you're getting some next month, aren't you? All right, well, she's been pretty good now, isn't she?
Good morning. This morning I'm going to be reading to you from the book of John, chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. This is the NIV version. The shepherd and his flock. I tell you the truth. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all of his own, he goes on ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Hey, good morning, dear friends. My name is Aldana Allen, and I serve as the pastor here of Providence United Methodist Church. It is a joy to be able to celebrate this Lord's Day with you. Thank you for tuning in and watching our service today. I'm excited to announce the return of our indoor worship service and our parking lot service next Sunday. Hopefully the first Sunday in March, weather permitting, we will be able to return to an indoor 9 a.m. worship service. We do require mass for that service, but then you're also invited to come and be a part of our 1030 parking lot service. We ask that you stay in your vehicles and listen to the service over the radio. It'll also be live streamed on Facebook and recorded so you have a variety of op uh, options to participate. But again, thank you for joining with us today. 
I also want to say thank you for your participation in our most recent missions. If you look at our Facebook page, you can see the great items that were collected that went to the Meals on Wheels and the Rowan County Warmth Tree. So thank you for that. And we are looking forward to our Heifer Project and the Read to Feed. We want the kids to sign up, to select a book, to get sponsored, and to get active as we continue this wonderful tradition and ministry of our congregation. And lastly, I want to say just a personal word of thanks as well. Many of you knew of some of the passings that I've experienced in my family this past week, and you've sent cards and made phone calls. And I, as your pastor, I just want to again say thank you, and I appreciate your care and your concern of me. For those of you who may not be aware, I had, um, I had an uncle on my mother's side of the family and an aunt on my dad's side of the family both pass away within one day of each other. So uh, occasionally some of my family from Mississippi tune in and watch our broadcast. If any of them are watching this morning, just know that I love you and I'm thinking about you during this difficult time as well for, my, uh, for the family of Uncle Philip and for the family of Aunt Ellis. I love you. So friends, last week we began our Lenten journey, and as we were talking about this season of Lent, we recognized that there are several themes that arise during this time of year. We began with an understanding of a call to repentance, that Lent is a time that causes us to reflect inward and to think about our lives and how we are out of place and out of sort with our Lord, and in particular to hear His summons one more time to us to come back home. We began with an understanding of repentance. But Lent also challenges us to grapple with our faith. It's during this time of year that we are allowed to question, to think, to, to ponder anew. We reflect theologically and we reflect on the practices that we are doing. And we go searching deeper for the Lord. There are several scriptures in the Bible that talk about this type of searching this type of questioning, even this kind of doubting. But one text, I think, exemplifies this. Look with me this morning to Luke chapter 7, beginning at verse 18. The words will be on the screen, but I know several of you like to read from your own Bibles or your own tablets or smart devices. Take a moment to find Luke chapter 7. I'll be reading from verse 18 down to verse 23. Dear friends, the NRSV puts it this way. The disciples of John reported all these things to him. So John summoned two of his disciples and sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to ask you, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus had just then cured many people of diseases, of plagues, and of evil spirits. And he had given sight to many who were blind. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. In the 1970s, the Coca-Cola advertising team came out with a new slogan. Well, it wasn't really a new slogan. It was one that they used in the 1940s, and it had only a moderate amount of success, but they brought it back, and this time it caught on like wildfire. It, it, it simply said this, Coke, it's the real thing. Irva Hubert, who was the brand manager of the time, had done a focus group and testing and realized that people were searching that they were looking for something in the midst of what they considered to be a lot of phonies. That there had been a time of disinformation, of confusion, of upheaval in the country, and, and distrust with politicians, and Watergate, and all this kind of stuff going on. And, and so people were looking for something that they could 
call real. Coca-Cola seized on this moment, brought back its campaign from the 1940s and said that it is the real thing. I think there are times in all of our lives whenever we want to be able to count on something. We want to be able to put our hand on it. We want to be able to stand strong and firm on it. We want to say that it is the real thing. Well, I come to tell you this morning, dear friends, that Jesus is the real thing. Now, that's not to say that we don't have times in our lives whenever we have some confusion. It's not to say that we don't have times in our lives when we don't have some wonders and some doubts. As a matter of fact, I don't think that we could be human if we didn't at times scratch our head and try to figure out what in the world the Lord was up to. Now, I know the old school wisdom says that you don't question God. The old school wisdom, if you came to church a, 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 a while back ago, the old school wisdom would say that God is God and God is sovereign and God does what God wants. And, and I believe all those things are true. But I also believe that God is big enough to handle our questions and our doubts. God is big enough to handle whenever we are wondering, is He the real thing? Is this the real deal? Can I trust this? for the rest of my life. Dear friends, if you've ever had any of those questions, I want you to know that you are not alone. Job had questions for God. David had questions for God. Many of the great people in the Bible had questions for God. And here we even see John the Baptist having questions about what or who Jesus is. He asked this question, are you the one we are to wait for? Now you would think of all the people, it seems like John the Baptist would be the one who would be the most rock solid sure of Jesus. Of all the people, it seems like John the Baptist would be the one who would have zero doubt that Jesus is the Messiah. After all, we are told in several accounts of his interactions with Jesus. Why, in Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 41... We are told that Mary, the mother of Jesus, goes to visit a family member of hers named Elizabeth. Elizabeth is pregnant with John at the time. When Mary tells Elizabeth about her own pregnancy, about Jesus growing within her, the baby inside of Elizabeth, this is John as a baby, leaps in its mother's womb. We are left to understand that even in a prenatal form, John was excited about the good news of Jesus. Same thing in Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. Here we see that Jesus comes to John to be baptized. John is there calling people to repentance, calling people to be baptized. Jesus shows up and John looks at Jesus and knows who he is right away and he says, there's, there, there's no way I can baptize you. I'm not even worthy to untie your sandals. Jesus says, permit it to be so for now. And John baptizes Jesus. And then the Bible says that the clouds opened up and the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove descended upon Jesus. And then there was a voice that came out of heaven that said, this is my son, my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. John witnessed all of this. In John chapter 1, verse 35, John sees Jesus and sends some of his own disciples over to Jesus. He uses these exact words. He says, I must decrease so that he can increase. Remember that. We're going to come back to that again next week. My point is, of all the people who you would think would not have had any question about who Jesus is, you would figure that it would be John. But here we see John asking this question. We have this, this, this interchange of, of disciples going back and forth, of messengers going back and forth between John and Jesus. And John is now wondering, Jesus, are you the one? Are you the Messiah? Are you the one we are supposed to wait for? Or is there someone else? The first thing I'd like for you to know, dear friends, is that honest questions and honest doubt is not a sin. If, if, if there's been some things that have happened in the course of your life over this last year and you've got some honest doubts and some honest questions that you want to lift up to the Lord, I believe that God is more than willing to hear them. 
Honest questions are not a sin. People who are strong in the faith still have moments of doubt, especially whenever they face a crisis. So what changed for John? What, what happened in John's life to make him now ask this question? Well, friends, I think there's two things to be mentioned here. I'll tell you both of them and then we'll go into some detail on them. The first thing is that John is, is having a crisis as he is in prison, which then prompts this question. And the second reason is that John has an unmet expectation that prompts this question. He's in prison and he has an unmet expectation and that leads him to this question about Jesus. Well, let's talk about this prison situation. John is in a prison cell waiting to be executed. He has angered King Herod Antipas. He dared to call out the king's sinful behavior. The same way that he was at the Jordan River calling people to repent, calling people to be baptized, he says the same thing of the king of the land. He calls out the king's sin. In particular, he talks about how the king has, has slept with his brother's wife. He dares to call out the king's sin. The king throws him in prison and he has been there. And you need to know something. The commentators say that it is possible that John has been in prison for almost a year now. Maybe even a little bit more. Think about that. Tell me if this sounds familiar. For at least a year now, John has been on lockdown. For a year now, his usual routine has been preempted. For a year now, all of his hopes and dreams have been dashed and lost. For a year now, he has waited for the Messiah to come and turn everything around. And he has not seen the change that he thought he would see. John asked this question because he's facing this moment of crisis. And John asked this question because there's an expectation that is going unmet and unfulfilled. In our own moments of crisis, I expect that questions will arise when we have those times of personal sickness, when we are struggling within our physical body, when we hear a report from the doctor that we did not want to hear, it can cause some questions to come to mind. Whenever there is injury or harm or potential harm to one of our loved ones, our family members, it can cause us to question. Whenever there are safety or provisions that seem to be lacking, our job situation is in question or in doubt, it can cause us to wonder what the Lord is doing. When our relationships are going through pain, whether it's with our spouses or our siblings or our adult children from which we are estranged, it can cause us to do some thinking, some questioning, and some doubting. In particular, our unmet expectation, I'm going to give voice to it now. Lord, if you are who you say you are, then why aren't you fixing this? Hmm. Notice John's question is not one of disobedience. I said earlier, I don't think that honest doubt and honest questions are a sin. John's question is not one of disobedience, but rather one of relationship. John is seeking a deeper relationship with Jesus. Everything that he has already known previously is great, but, but now he wants to know, are you really the one? Are you really the one that I should continue to pin all of my belief, my hopes, and my dreams on? Or is there someone else that you can point me to? Real faith, dear friends, is not the denial of the question. Listen, real faith is the acceptance of the answer. Real faith is not the denial of the question. Real faith is the acceptance of the answer. Let me share this quote from Dr. Jean Bay. What does it mean to be a Christian? Well, it means to hear the call of Christ to follow me and to respond to it. The essence of the Christian life is discipleship, but it doesn't mean that you have no doubts or fears. It doesn't mean that you are nicer or better than the rest of humanity. It doesn't mean that you have it all settled beforehand and know exactly who Jesus is either. It simply means that even in your questions and even in your doubting, 
that you accept the answer that Jesus provides. Notice that Jesus doesn't get angry at John about asking him the question. Notice Jesus doesn't say, how dare you doubt me after all this time, after leaping in your mother's womb, after baptizing me, after everything else, why are you questioning, now, questioning me now? Jesus doesn't say any of those things. Notice the way that Jesus does answer his question. Jesus emphasizes all of the people who are being blessed. Basically, he says, John, I need you to lift your eyes from your own situation. I know that you are discouraged right now, and that has caused you to narrow your view, but I need you to lift your eyes and broaden your perspective. I know the hurt and the pain that you're going through has caused you to question some things, but if you look at it from a larger lens, you will see that I am truly who I said I am. Jesus instructs those disciples to go back to John and say, Tell him what you have seen and what you have heard, what you have witnessed me doing. Tell him how you have seen blind people receive sight and how the deaf have recovered their hearing. Tell him how people who could not move now have movement in their limbs. Tell him how even those who were dead now rise and live again. Go tell John. All the great and wonderful things that are taking place. And John, by inference, you will hear and know that my power is still alive and real and on display all around you. It may not be happening exactly in your life the way that you want it to right at this exact moment. You want it on your timetable, on your, in, in your time frame. But that does not mean that Jesus is not who he says he is. He very much is the real thing. Now, based on my own experience and together what I've observed over the years of being a pastor, there are a few things that I believe that you can pretty much count on happening to you if you are serious about following Jesus. Dear friends, you can expect to be challenged and changed. You can expect to be disturbed and shaken out of the comfortable ruts that most of us get ourselves into and frankly prefer to stay in. You can expect to have struggle with issues and questions that you would rather ignore if it were not for Jesus prompting you. Questions like, who is my neighbor? And what is my obligation to her or him? What are my responsibilities as a prosperous Christian in a world of poverty? How am I, as a follower of Jesus, supposed to respond when it seems as though there's continued chaos in the world and the world is going one way and the gospel calls us to go another? Dear friends, I, I come to tell you today that there are going to be some things in your life that will shake you, that will, that will stir you up a bit. And the season of Lent is a perfect time to reflect again deeply and theologically about the faith that you say that you have and the person that you say you believe in. And by asking some of those questions, we come back again out on the other side with our faith strengthened. There is a certain amount of trust that has to go into it. There is a certain amount of not walking by, by knowledge and not walking by sight, but walking by Yes, faith, absolutely. But then there's also a certain amount of room and space and grace that the Lord gives us to ponder, to question, to reflect, and to be built up and made stronger through that process. I don't know what all has taken place over for you the last several months, almost a year now. The places where you may have felt confined and locked down. The places where you have had your options limited. The places where life has been painful. But I do want to stress to you again today that Jesus is the real thing. His power is on display in multiple places all around us. And you need to continue to hold on and have trust because the same power that is on display and used for others will come back to you also. He loves you dearly. He has not forgotten you. He, he calls you to follow and to serve. Dear friends, Jesus says that His actions speak louder than His words ever could. We're so thankful that the words are written down for us because we weren't there to witness. But, but Jesus tells John 
in that prison awaiting execution with all of his concerns and doubts. John, yes, I'm the one. My actions see the work that has been done and know that your faith is not in vain. Continue to put your trust solely and squarely in me. Dear friends, this is the hope that I present to you again during this Lenten journey. Take time to wrestle, to question, to doubt even, but know that the Lord is building you up stronger through this journey, through everything that you've had to experience, and know that He is with you. Go in peace, dear friends. In Jesus' name, amen. Way my dad, and when I